1955, there were 420 species of plants in the Coliseum. I said that can't be true. Like I've been to the Coliseum, there's no plants there. <laughs> this beautiful golden stones and a lot of tourists. Um, and so immediately this idea of a novel sprang to mind, set in this rich jungle, herbaceous place. It's so different from what we think of today. Um, and I knew that I wanted to structure the novel like a flora, sort of set myself these parameters in my own writing. I, I wanted to have these short snapshots of each species moving through um, Deacon's original flora, starting with Clematis and going all the way up to Maiden Hair Fern, um, and to use them as sort of opportunities to write prose poems, to focus so intensely and tightly on a given plant um, that would drive the narrative too, but that would, that would ask the reader to bring the same kind of close attention to the page and to the natural world. Um, so that was my starting point. I have the structure, I have Deacon's Flora. <clears throat> now, who are the characters who are gonna populate this world? Uh, and one thing that struck me about uh, reading Deacon's original Flora is that his language is very poetic. He's not just saying, you know, how many rats and peoples he's counting. He's also talking about the history of these plants and their mythology and how they're used in cooking and medicine. Um, he sometimes writes little poems about them. Uh, and I thought, this ends up being like a very masculine place. <laughs> what if Deacon himself weren't really the author of the Bora, but a woman who was working as an assistant and didn't get the credit? So that's where the first character came from, this idea of a, a female assistant who was indentured to him, who was doing the actual labor, moving through the stones of the Colosseum, counting all these tiny little weeds. Um, and how much that parallels the experience of women in the world who are overlooked in the same way that weeds are overlooked, um, undervalued, who are, you know, people are trying to dig them out constantly. Um, and then I paired her story with a contemporary narrator who's doing the same work. So she is a graduate student in botany who's traveled over from Mississippi uh, to Rome to see which of Deacon's original 420 species still exist. Um, and thus it becomes kind of a narrative about climate change and, and why things go missing. Um, and both women are encountering advisors, male botanists who are uh, not encouraging of their intellectual growth um, and they have to use the plants in various ways to assert their own identity um, and also start fighting back. Uh, one of the characters that appears a few times in the book is a ghost, and we have to kind of figure out who the ghost belongs to. Um, so that's for a brief introduction. I'll read a little bit uh, in the caveat and we'll talk about process. Um, the first section I'll read. I think all of these are from the contemporary narrator's voice. They alternate in the narrative. This is Dr. Smurkata's prickly seated carrot. Queen Anne's lace, Dr. Carota, has been spotted in basically every iteration of the Flora of Colossia except 1855, which suggests to me either that Deacon was drunk, his assistant was daft, or some moody boy child snuck in at midnight and dug up all the wild carrots. The roots for his hungry ma, the giant white bubbles for his sweetheart, who would of course have been allergic, leaving an inexplicable Dr. Corona blank in the mid-19th century record. Funny, Deacon might have thought, I have them in my own garden. This is the central fallacy of botanical endeavors, that what is familiar ought to be familiar, and what is strange ought to be strange. Instead, he just found Dr. Mercatus which isn't a bad carrot. In fact, its bundle of purple spiked fruit gathered up like a goth bouquet makes it unusually appealing, but the gaps haunt the process. What didn't he find because blank? What am I not finding because I too am blank? I stretch my neck back to scan the highest remaining ring of the Colosseum's round walls. I almost expect to see a stone pine bursting out of the rock. 80 feet tall. My father, who hasn't spoken much in the past decade, put his hand on my shoulder the night before I hopped the plane to Rome and said, quiet, 
don't forget us. I wanted to say, I need to forget you. Looking for these plants homesick is like reading a book distracted. I keep landing on the same sentence. Stalkus muricatus. There. Stalkus muricatus. I check my phone. No messages. How can I forget? Stalkus muricatus. Let me move on. The next is Soledago vergaria, common goldenrod. Strange in the ubiquity of goldenrods to find only one species here, or rather, not find one. I put another line through Deacon's list. I imagine him running a bracket of yellow flowers under his nose, recording its particularity in his notebook in that feminine hand. Sometimes it's nice to imagine Deacon as a crossdresser. A woman who wanted to fight in the wars of science and so tucked her hair in a cap and bound her breath and carried a sword. Her mother at home weeping, her father flustered but proud. How could he not be he who wanted a son? Only at night, sleeping in the trenches tight quarters with a dozen other botanists, does she worry about being found out, a hand thrown over her chest accidentally, a furtive peeing in the woods interrupted by a roving sentry. What's the punishment for a woman being a man? Henry Ford thought gas had a short future, so he built cars out of soybeans, ran them on alcohol. To Thomas Edison, he gave a special Model T with tires made from goldenrod. A flower car. I like to picture Ford saying winsomely, from me to you, men with daisies, women in war. Soledadio leaves contain 7% rubber. We all have short futures. Orcus. Orcus pyramidalis, Orcus pastilium, they see. To clarify, Orcus has a spurred lower lip. Orphyrus's is unspurred. One of them got kissed too much. My advisor has asked me to describe, in words, the structure of the orchid blossom. This is a test to determine whether I'll get a letter of reference out of them. Not the only test, I bet. Since there aren't any orchids here anymore, beauty not sturdy enough for a climatological apocalypse, I look at the pictures on the internet, pornographic. Striated lower lip, I write, three top horns. Ons, cluster of three to five flowers per inflorescence, fuchsia, small throat, achingly small, almost voiceless. I hand in my notes with a sketch of a woman, legs spread like wings. Is this supposed to be a orchid? He asks. Oh, sorry, I say, pointing to the bend in her knee. It's a grasshopper. I'm also studying entomology. The last one I'll read is Monastera caprifolium, pair of perfoliate honeysuckle. Some folks get freaked out by spiders or locust swarms, but what crawls my skin is vines that send out suckers or rootlets or sticky hairs or hold fast. Ivy, Virginia creeper, trumpet vine, cat's claw. Twining vines, though, are perfectly polite. This isn't the kind that grows where you're from, my advisor says. We're having lunch only because he couldn't find a more intimate time to meet. He's banned me from his office hours, saying he has real students to see then. I can't tell if these punishments are calculated or if I'm paranoid or conditioned to paranoia. In this cafe, too far from the Coliseum, I'm wrapped with anxiety about who's going to pay. Wrapped is an exaggeration. I do restrict myself to soup. If you pay closer attention, he says, sketching on his napkin the leaf with the stem puncturing the center. See, Japonica and Sempervirens don't have portfolio top leaves. Is he suddenly teaching me so he can prevent a lawsuit? Every time I press my research agenda, he raises objections like a gymnastics judge holding up scores. I've tried flattering him. Look, I've learned how important Florence can be. Impressing him? 
No one's done this type of urban site specific flora in the US. Lecturing them. Do you understand how vital such a study would be to populations grappling with climate justice as we speak? How they are stakeholders in this data? So he just said climate justice. His mustache is flecked with mayonnaise. Didn't you get into all this? I try again from some sort of personal interest. Personal? His eyes tunnel back like his childhood is rushing at him, just banks and swords of poison ivy. His fat baby arms puff jeweled at his upper lip a balloon. I mean, we do what we do as adults because of the wonder we experienced as children. Like I'm sure Jacques Cousteau probably loved splashing around the tub. And my sandbox was filled with Lana Serra. No, I mean, maybe, was it? But you probably liked plants always. Maybe they were an escape. Maybe your parents yelled at each other in a too small apartment, but there was a tract of woods behind the complex where you could at least hear your own thoughts, right? We get opened up to something at some point and then follow that feeling. I immediately regret the last word. He shakes his head. I studied plants. Plants, he says. The waitress comes and leaves the check in the middle, and I say, Get up to you, but don't move a muscle. If he makes that expression at me one more time, that mouth twist, brow flick, eternal smirk, I'm going to stuff the bill in my mouth and swallow it. Scrooge didn't even offer dessert. It doesn't seem like some shocking thing to want to do science that is also meaningful, I say, hot all over. If you want a story, write a memoir, he says. You're either a botanist, in which case you study the species, the actual species, not the ones you feel by presence, or else you're someone who just likes to keep journals. I do not like to keep journals. I want to scream. I want to scream. I do like to keep journals, and what of it? The vision of a honeysuckle vine wrapping itself around his throat appears. I can't shake it. <laughs> happy. I want to thank you again for the beautiful work that we've seen here. Also, for those of you in the room afterwards, you can I encourage you to go look at the picture while it's up close. Um, so just to start, I'm curious about your own journey in botany and where your love of plants came from, <laughs> and whether you were always the kid out in the out in the woods, whether you had Anna Sarah in your sandbox. <laughs> No, <laughs> I grew up in um, Southern California in one of the urban suburbs of LA County. There was no native plants. Uh, my dad was from Holland, so we had lots of flowers in our tiny garden. So the only thing I knew were visits to um, the Arboretum and other botanical gardens to see pretty flowers. And I, since my dad was Dutch and he, Worked on a tulip farm, did all that stuff. He brought my love of plants very early. So <clears throat> by the time I was in junior high, I was propagating my little plants on the windowsill and growing herbs, but that's, that's it. And um, I didn't really get into botany much. And then I cast it aside until in high school, I took a native plants class. And we actually had to get on a bus and travel for hours to actually go see some native climates. <laughs> it was really kind of sad. It was very concrete. <laughs> but that was the start. Um, and then nothing to do with plants until we moved here and got involved with the native plants program and the botanical um, art program. And when did you move here? 95. 95, yeah. And never went back. I was always a figurative artist. But, um, and I never would draw plants, but I mean, switched and yeah, I'm never tired of it. The <laughs> artist who, who would do the primary portraiture and then the background was always so floriferous. Sometimes another artist would do the background, but that's the part I always loved. Like seeing the tiny goats in the trees and the streams right. behind the stayed woman. Um, so what made you move from figurative art into the botanical? Were you feeling constrained by um, what you would have worked on? I think what influenced me in the figurative 
art was the urban setting that I was used to. Everything was around people. Here, you move here and what do you see? You just see trees, vastness of trees and plants. So it's hard not to be influenced by it, yeah. yeah. And so did you get involved with the botanical garden early just as like a, a visitor and a fan or were you? No, um, I think at the time, I'm not sure if I was teaching or if I was a nature educator at the time, but um, I went straight into the art program they had here for a few years, walked away and then came back after I was done with my teaching stint and then went back to finish the program. But instead I ended up being one of the instructors here. So for the last 10 years, yeah. My, one of uh, my mother's pandemic uh, activities was starting to do botanical illustration herself. And so she took a class, I think at the New York Botanical Garden over Zoom. Um, and watching her learn how to use graphite and then color pencils and watercolor pencils to bring the flowers in her garden to life has been so interesting because she's always been a gardener. But I think botanical illustration asks you to look at plants in, in a different way with a different lens. I wonder if you could talk at all about that sort of shift in perspective. Um, yeah, for botanical illustration, it's, uh, you know, it's the marriage of science and art. And so whatever you depict has to stay true to the plant and it has to be very accurate. You look up the botanical terms and usually for me, who's not a botanist, it's every um, subject I um, draw is a new exploration. And, and just like with your writing with each chapter, it's you study, you learn the, um, what to look for. And for me, I'm not interested in flowers so much. It's weird to be a botanical artist and not be a flower artist. It's very rare you see flower in there. I'm more interested in the rest of the life cycle or what happens after the plant is no longer a plant. So, um, yeah, so. Yeah, you're making very specific choices, which brings the art side of the art and science marriage into it. Um, it's one thing to just depict what is before you, but you're choosing what stage of the cycle to bring it to life. And that's what first drew me to your art is that it wasn't, you know, picture perfect little roses um, where you see like the bud and the rose and the hip. Um, you're, you're grappling with plants in these kind of prickly thorny states of mid decay um, that, that make the plant seem much more filled with personality and sort of ominous purpose um, than many of the illustrations I had seen before. Um, and I'm wondering if you ever got pushback on that from teachers or other colleagues who are like, you know, these are, these are disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I guess it's, it's difficult when I'm teaching in my classes and, um, you know, they want to do a beautiful orchid or, or lily or something. And, you know, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll just take the other, the other instructor. But um, in the past, when I did figurative work, it was always, um, and I did a lot of illustration work for magazines and they were psychological portraits. So they were always dealing with the frailty of the human condition. So with plants, I see flowers in their perfect state as giving them celebrity status. Well, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in everyday life. So that's any other day of their life, of a plant's life could be something I might want to depict. Yeah. So. I feel the same way in teaching when I have students who, my books, most of most my books will die, main characters die. Um, and, and my students often seem very distressed by this. And I don't want to say, well, if you want your characters to survive, like you can also take another teacher out there and there are other people out there. Um, so yes, I, I appreciate the kindred spirit in you. <laughs> um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the process of this book in particular um, and what it was like to work together. So I reached out to <laughs> last spring and said, I've written this book. I want it to be illustrated. My publishers like adult books don't have illustrations. <laughs> I said, this one's different. Um, and I explained to them what a botanical explorer was and how vital it was to have the sort of same scientific data, the text combined with these illustrations. Um, and I said, and they said, oh, well, we can find some historical plates to kind of accompany this. Um, I said, no, because this isn't really a historical book. This is a book about a woman in the modern era in communication with the past and with the woman in the past. 
and their perspective on these flowers is so unique to the experiences that they're having in science. Um, and so it has to feel modern and spiky. Um, and I then I sent my editor some links to Kathy's Instagram account. And my editor was like, uh, okay, I understand. Um, and so then I reached out to you and asked if you would have any interest in collaborating, both sort of combining images that you'd already made that I loved, but also working on some new images specifically for this book. Um, and what did you think when you got that initial email? I thought it was spam. <laughs> <laughs> I thought nobody reaches out on Instagram and asks you to do some illustrations. So I I went and I, I searched you out and I looked out and I thought it took a few few correspondence back and forth to say, okay, I think that's legitimate. <laughs> it was different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the way it was. But, and then yeah. had you had you done any collaborative projects? To this, working with other um, other no, I used to do illustration work all the time, but it had been quite a while, and I usually don't because I'm so busy teaching and doing my own drawings, and I just kind of left all that. So this was refreshing, and it was new and exciting, but very tight deadline. Yeah, I gave you a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I think within a month I did five drawings. Um, so out of those, five of them are new and the rest were from previous sketchbook and, and drawings and preliminary drawings for other paintings that she was able to use. So. And one interesting thing about your process is that you tend to work from life. You prefer to work from life. And I initially had come to her with all of these plants that were growing in Rome. I was like, can you, can you just show some of these for, in, your, in your art? And she's like, well, I can't get no. to Rome. So no. Um, and that made me rethink the purpose of the illustrations. And so what I realized was that the drawings in the book would not be illustrating the Flora Colossia in Rome, but would be illustrations of this research project that my contemporary narrator has developed in the book. It's the research agenda that her advisor keeps shutting her down for, which is to do a Flora Colossia of the Colosseum in Jackson, Mississippi, where she's from, um, which is a gaudy, decrepit structure in a very decrepit southern city, um, which I'm from and proud of, but also there's a lot going on there right now. Um, and her advisor, you know, naturally says that no one wants to read it a floor written about the Jackson Coliseum. Um, but the plates, uh, the list of plates in the back of the book, uh, describe each or name each species and then it's titled Flora Coliseum Mississippiana. And so for me, that's a sign that she has, in some future space, accomplished this flora against her advisor's advice. Um, and so we decided to use plants that were cousins or closely related to many of the species in the Roman flora, but that could be found in the southeast that would be mostly native to them. Um, and that just, her own parameters changed my understanding of the book and it changed the way my, my narrator did. Um, and so that was really exciting to me to be able to sort of bounce ideas off of you and come to this new conclusion. And was it hard at all when you were working on the new species? Um, to what extent were you thinking about just working in the format that you had been for the previous drawings? And to what extent were you influenced by the text that I had sent or thinking, oh gosh, like these are gonna be a novel, like do they need to have any kind of different aspects to them? Um, <clears throat> for some of the newer ones, um, there is a little bit of symbology in it. Um, and I did include the paper on about the art for the violet one over there. There's a lot of symbology in it, but also I knew she wanted a kind of an edgy contemporary feel. So um, uh, usually whatever I, whenever I take on a new project, I always twist it just a little bit and um, for the unexpected. So I included some of that in there. And then sometimes the text really helped. Um, the honeysuckle one was one that had already been in my um, sketchbook, but that one, for instance, which is highly invasive here and just strangles everything is that that one came from, uh, we were clearing a bunch of honeysuckle at home and there was just these big beefy vines that twisted like a constrictor until they're just about strangled. So it went 
really well with what she had written and there was nothing pleasing to look at. It's a nice drawing, I admit, but, but, but just looking at it, you feel your guts just being crushed. So um, a lot of times there was, she gave me so much leeway. She just said, this is the plant, deal with it. And, and she sent the text that went along with it, but I had a lot of freedom and um, that's the perfect scenario for being an illustration an illustrator is to be able to have that that freedom and thank you for that but um yeah and the honeysuckle is a perfect example because i think when readers come to the page and they say oh honeysuckle the first thought is the flower yeah i'm like oh i love honeysuckle. oh i imagine the scent and the ants feeding pick the flowers and suck the sap out and then the next thing you see is this <laughs> is this image of tangled uh vines that, that look like something out of a horror movie um and then you're already on edge and you read the text and you're like oh i should be on edge this is a dangerous plant this is a woman in a dangerous space uh mentally um so yeah i, I really appreciated how i didn't have to say much at all to you and you just understood sort of where i wanted to go with the narrative um and, and it's a broader question for you about the ways that art and text interact. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that good adult literature is typically not illustrated and that we have pretty clear boundaries between art forms. We have painting, we have literature, we have music, and we don't usually experience them in combination, um, which I think is to our detriment. I think there's so much that can be gained from that interplay. And I'm wondering how you feel about those boundaries and whether as an illustrator, you too are looking for ways to sort of break them down at all. Well, it kind of goes both ways because um, when people see my artwork there, they're not gonna feel the same things that they're getting from uh, your novel. And um, there's just so much that you can get that, that kind of deepens and widens your experience. So, you know, when I was talking about the symbology with the, the drawings and the emotions or like with the Jimson weed, with the, the prickles and the seeds being cast out. And also when you're reading, everybody has their own intimate vision of what's going on in the book. And then all of a sudden you're given an image where well, you can't get rid of that image. So, but these are kind of an abstraction because they're not describing exactly what's going on in the book, but there are a visual translation of it. Does that yeah, make sense? Really, that <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like if there, was, if there was a plate with like a woman having lunch with a man and like, a, you know, check in the middle and then like some honeysuckle vines outside the cafe window, that would be too invasive in the reader's mind. The reader would be allowed to create the scene for herself. Um, but to have just this stark image, as an as emotional guidepost, I don't that. Yeah. Um, as a teacher, how has translating your work into the classroom for students affected how you approach it? I know you have students here. Uh, uh, wait, what was the last part again? How I approach what? How you approach uh, teaching has affected your own art. Like if, as you explain things, and try to break down how something's put together. Do you find that changing the way that you approach? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think you would have to ask my students. <laughs> um, I, I'm a pretty, well, I don't know what kind of teacher I am. I, I do a lot with the techniques and everything and I focus on that. When um, they're working on their own work, I encourage them to look for subjects and go outside the normal realm of what they would expect because usually when they come in they they see the beautiful botanical art traditional illustrations and um we a lot of times do projects that have nothing re to relate to that so and they're so disappointed and then they see the art that's produced and they realize that they're just all in the world out yeah there. yeah what i do what we do a lot is actually dig in deep and um they're forced to study all the little teeny intricacies how things connect and everything and I think that's a big part of widening their viewpoint of what botanical art is, because it's, um, you know, it's not the leaf looks like this, it's cordate or whatever, but it's has might have little bracts or little 
little things that are going on. I'm not a botanist, so I'll probably mess that up. So neither of us are botanists. We don't have to give any botany questions. We're going to just lovers of plants. Yeah. Um, what do you have next going on in your in your art career? Um <laughs> Starting fresh, I think I'm going to do some large stuff, which will be different, but um, I've been leaning more towards monochromatic. Um, I just joined an artist co-op with Jane. This is my friend Jane, Sienna type artist. And um, that is local. I don't do anything local. So uh, this is more gallery stuff. So, so we'll have a one man show there. And then I have another one person show coming up. So it's just a lot of production. Um, and it evolves as I go, so I'm not sure what you said large scale, how large? Um, full, full paper size. So for me, it's like that. Usually I work like that. So it's, it will be a little, not super tight on a large <laughs> yeah. scale, a little bit looser. Yeah. Do you like having new challenges? Yes. Yeah. Every piece has to be a challenge. I in feel fact, the same way. Yeah, in fact, for the drawings for these, a lot of those, the ones, the new ones that I did, like the Queen Anne's Lace and the Jimson Weed, those were very difficult to depict and to draw. So um, yeah, and as far as challenges, uh, the one way that I kind of develop a drawing, especially like with the violets, is I don't just grab a plant, bring it in and draw it. Um, I think botanical artists and illustrators uh, have a lot of disregard for the plant specimen because we will bring it in and we have a vision of what we want to do, but it's not what the plant looks like. So we will rip and tear into it and have several plants that we go through and um, hopefully you can save part of it and put it back, tuck it back under the soil, but um, they are never, what you see there is not what we actually find out in the wild, at least for me, a lot of people just draw what they see. Um, and then I can manipulate it, put it back together, but it has to be true to that specific plant. I can't alter that, that, that stuff to stay true. But. It's so parallel to writing fiction. We, we go out to the world and take these experiences of other people and characters and we break them down and we deconstruct them for our purposes. Mm -hmm. um, to, to manipulate them in our art, we piece them back together and try to do so in as naturalistic a way as possible so that readers, viewers are convinced that this is the real thing. Wow. But it, it's not the real thing. We are, we are creating the illusion of reality. We're mass manipulators. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, um, can I ask you a couple yeah. questions then? Sorry. Um, I'm curious because, you know, Deacon was, is a mystery to most of us. Most of us never heard of him. And when you research him, you can't find anything except for maybe the article, like what your mom found, which I found. Um, and there's nothing really about his uh, life or anything. How did you go about doing some research on, besides just the flora in that time period? Yeah, so I didn't actually research Deacon very much. Um, I found out sort of his a little bit more about his background. Um, but then when I realized that I, I didn't want him to be the primary focus of the novel, that's when I shifted gears to these two women. Um, and then I was researching like, what is it like to be a woman in mid 19th century Italy, um, especially a lesbian woman? What would, what would her family have thought? Um, she has a, a lover that she has um, since left her and she's broken hearted about. Uh, so figuring out sort of her cultural milieu and what she would have known about plants already, um, how women would have been seen in relation to plants, sort of connotations of witchiness. Uh, so I loved doing the research there. And then I kind of let Deacon go a little bit. I was like, I don't need to know who you actually were because I just want you to be this character for this book. And the character that I make him is pretty malevolent. And so I apologize sure. to the descendants of the real <laughs> It's not an accurate portrayal of your ancestors. Yeah. And um, so I also found out about the Colosseum, which I really didn't realize, and I guess you found out from the, the reading about it too, is that, um, and I'm not sure, you know, when you look at old artwork and stuff, you see it overflowing, just lush, this Garden of Eden, until it switched. Um, you've been there and you've been to the Colosseum. And so apparently at some point, the archeologist restored it and got rid of most of the plants. 
Yeah, so it was mostly during the 20s and 30s under the great Mussolini. Um, we did many things poorly and one thing well, which was um, restoring ancient architecture in Rome. Uh, and he had this vision of, of bringing these spaces back to, to a kind of original glory. Um, and it involved eradicating most of the plant life from them. Um, because the plant life is also hiding a lot of human misbehavior. Uh, so robbers would, you know, frequent the Colosseum and prostitutes. Um, and he said, yeah, no, there's no room in a modern room for that. Um, so as a result, we lost a lot of plant life. Um, I have not been to the Colosseum since working on this project, though. So the last time I went, I wasn't thinking about plants at all. And now I'm desperate to know if I went back, if I would, if I would see it as a green space instead of a, a stone brown space. Um, because I, I didn't have those those lenses on when I was there last. Um, but now I feel like I have to go back. Okay, so one of the other questions I have is you use a lot of botanical terms. And if you know nothing about botany when you're reading the book, it's like, oh gosh, I got to look this up. What is this? What is this? But you take the words and you twist them in a the poetic way and they become metaphors as to what's going on. I mean, they're, they're lush and they're descriptive and it's like you're just you're describing humans instead of plants. I'm so glad that you brought that way. I was worried. It's another very scientific book. And I thought, is this going to alienate readers um, who don't have a botanical background? And I didn't have a botanical background when I wrote it. And so what was exciting to me about those words as you mentioned, was the way that they can be played with and used to rhyme with words we know, used to evoke sort of the human element going on. Um, and so I almost prefer a reader without any botany to approach this book because they're like, oh, what is that strange word? And like, oh, that just like feels good in the mouth. Um, and like a real botanist group this, they would just be like, oh, that's incorrect. <laughs> There are some real botanists in this room. <laughs> there are some real botanists in this room, so you can tell me where my errors are. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what else? So you're not a botanist. Did you get a chance to just kind of play the botanist assistant and go out and try to, to see what it would be physically like to, to do yeah. this? So a lot of my research was done on the internet. Uh, Wikipedia is a fabulous resource for learning about plants. Um, but it doesn't replicate the experience of moving through a space with very close attention. Uh, so I did go out to my own garden. I've always been a gardener. Um, but I've always been a gardener who did not bother to learn the names of weeds. If I saw a weed, it had to be removed. I didn't care what it was called. Um, and so with this book, I went out and said, what is this spine? What is this tiny green leaf thing? How does it grow? What is the root system like? If I'm attacking it from, you know, the stem, I've learned that, you know, you're not actually getting to the root or if you're getting the root. Now I know that they're, you know, long runners that if you break, will then multiply greater than ever. Um, and so that knowledge then helps me so much more as a gardener to actually understand what these plants were. And then also the power of naming, you know what some of these names, um, it's harder to hate it. Um, there's so many little weeds that have sweet names that I think, well, I don't want to eradicate you anymore. Um, so that's been a, a complicated, but I think joy is part of the process of having a greater appreciation for species that are doing their darndest to stay alive and have mastered the art of spreading and uh, being interactable. So props to them. Um. Let's see, that you've covered a lot of stuff. I don't know, is there anything else you would like to, to share? I don't think there's anything more, but I know we have some questions um, perhaps from the audience around Zoom that we can turn to. I'll hand it over to our moderators to do that. If anyone has any questions for me or for Kathy or for the process or about botany, yeah. I'm going to have Katie repeat the questions. I'm wondering if that. You've selected your plants. I'm wondering about the communication between the two of you. Kathy would send the honeysuckle and you'd say, Oh, that needs to be cut. Could it be spikier? Or would she say, I don't think honeysuckle is what you want, because blah, blah, blah. Did you have back and forth decisions about make it better, make it different? Yes, great question. So she's asking um, what our working process was like in terms of the back and forth of each plant. Um, did I 
did I offer criticism or guidance in terms of what I wanted? Um, and I'll say for the most part, no, that um, there was a little bit early on, we were trying to pick the dozen plates in the book um, where, you know, Kathy would say, oh, well, that, that's not in bloom yet, or that's not, you know, emerging from the soil. We were talking, I think, March of 2022, February, March. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, oh, like, that would be beautiful, but it's not in the garden yet. Um, so we had to do some shifts because of that. And then also I had to think about where the plants came in the book. So I didn't want them all bunched together at the beginning. I needed them fairly spread out. So I would say, oh, like she had a beautiful like sea oats um, that was close to maybe the garlic. I thought I want both of them, but they're just a page apart. And so I have to spread them out more. So I had to get rid of one. Um, but in terms of the actual drawings, when we came to our list of 12, I said, have fun, go wild. And then whatever she sent me, I was just like, this is incredible. Yeah, I don't think I edited. I edited it on my own end, but we didn't change anything. No, just editing, weeding out, weeding out some of the plants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We've got one on Zoom here. Go. Um, Katie, were there any plants in the flora that were particularly hard for you to incorporate in your narrative? That's a really good question. So this book, um, I use every species. So I, I take Deacon's original list of plants and use all of the species that uh, still exist in the Colosseum today, which I think is around 263. Um, and so I include every single one of them. I didn't allow myself to skip one. Um, and there are definitely some plants that, as I was researching, did not have any evocative character to them. They didn't have a funny name or uh, a toxicity that was interesting or a medical use that prompted me to think about something in terms of character. Um, and so then it was a matter of like, okay, I know this plant isn't going to advance the narrative right now. So what is it going to do? What can I find in it, um, in the sort of botanical parts of it that is interesting to share with the reader? Uh, and I liked those challenges because it made me think a little bit harder as a writer. Um, but there's there's like a lot of really sort of small weeds in this book. There's some big things. There's like there's a there's a cherry tree and there's a grapevine. And there's um, a caper, which is a fantastically showy blossom. And there's just a lot of like little grasses and mosses and like nutsedge and things that you have to figure out a way to make work near. One more question on Zoom and then we'll take some more of them. Um, this was also. Yeah, um, as, as a writer, I know. But you're, go ahead. No, no, okay. Um, as a writer, I was just wondering your process. Do you have like a routine where you write and you actually and paper and you just print the computer? I'm just curious about that aspect of it. Yeah, so this is a question about my writing process, um, how I write, whether I use pen and paper. Um, I find that for each book is quite different. Uh, so this is my fourth novel. The previous novels were sort of sprawling affairs and took quite a long time to work on and involved a lot of research and moving parts um, and tangents and dead ends. Um, with this book, for the first time, I wrote a book very, very quickly. So I wrote this in four months. Um, and I wrote 1,500 words a day uh, on the weekends. I had a full-time job and was very stressed out about finding writing time. So I'd come back from my full-time job and say, I'm writing 1,500 words a day, or I'm like not going to sleep. Um, and I'm ordinarily not all disciplined in that way. And so it was a new experience for me. Um, but I wanted to finish it in this given allowance of time that I had. Uh, I wrote on a computer, mostly at a coffee shop that's a few blocks from my house. Um, I never write in coffee shops. So like everything about it was strange, but it but it felt like this is what the novel needed for me. Um, and as a result, I was just able to power through it. And it was so easy to go from beginning to end because I had the structure of the flora. I knew that Deacon begins with a clematis. I have to begin with a clematis. So I didn't lose time to thinking about Oh, like where is the character going to go today? Or like, should I set a scene in like the grocery store or something? I had to write that clinics. And that freed me up to, I think, write more quickly and without as much self-doubt as I ever have. Um, that was kind of marvelous. Yeah. Any response 
that same question for process? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to respond to the same question about process? And, and what was the question again? Say it again. <laughs> Um, well, I'll go back to the violet and, and talk about that one because that was probably the most involved. Um, when we first connected, it was like February, something like that. And if you know the violets in your yard, and I have them everywhere, there's nothing. There's it's hard to find. They they're reduced to just little teeny leaves. So I dug several up. I brought them in and let the the warmth of the inside <laughs> encourage them to to um, grow more quickly. Um, I do a lot of research to see, to make sure that that is the one it's supposed to be. And midway, I thought it was a different violet. No, it's not that violet because the, the rhizomes or the root part is not the same. So um, that changed. And then um, from there, I do a lot of uh, thumbnails and like we do in the class, a lot of thumbnails on, on paper. And then I develop a comp on, on tracing paper. And then when I'm actually doing the drawing, I'm a little egotistical in that I have to finish something from start to finish, whether it's a leave or something else, I have to see it finished. Otherwise it's gonna drive me crazy. I don't work on the whole piece altogether at once. So um, that one was a lot of um, just piecing together. And usually my, my time is I work home in my studio, but it's in the afternoons and <laughs> a lot more time during that time period because it was just so boom, boom, boom. Towards the end, I was working very fast. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It's to be expected. <laughs> All right, from our Zoom audience, um, another one for Katie. You're back in Chapel Hill where you got your PhD in history, which must be an interesting full circle return. How much of your fiction is dependent on what you learned in your doctoral program, such as theory, research <laughs> methods, writing style, et cetera? <laughs> From my professor, all of my, all of my writing is dependent on my doctoral degree. <laughs> so much. Um, yeah, I think the honest answer is a lot. Uh, I know that in the history program when I was here, I often was um, feeling caught by the constraints of uh, academia, by historical research, and feeling a little bit claustrophobic, like I wanted to break out and write things that weren't necessarily in the historical record. Um, and when I started writing fiction, it was like, oh, I can use all this research, but get into hearts and feelings and emotions in a way that felt so much more three-dimensional and human to me. Um, and there was like a few months of my life when I thought I made a terrible mistake, why did I go to grad school for history? Like I'm unhappy, this isn't what I want to do. Like I, I wasted five years. And then ever since I, the last time I had that thought was you know, a decade ago. And ever since I've just been filled with gratitude for what I learned in the program. Um, I, I could not be the kind of researcher I am without the skills that I learned there and research is everything to me as a fiction writer. Um, the topics I'm interested in are always historical, um, and I wouldn't have had access to those stories without going through this process. I would not have learned about discipline if I hadn't gone through the process. Um, and so like everything that makes me at all accomplished as a novelist is, I think, a direct influence of, of getting a doctorate in history. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that um, your protagonists don't usually make it to the last page of the novel. <laughs> I'm wondering two things. One is that partly another um, relic of your PhD in history. And the other is, um, are you looking at the plants the same way in this book? Um, as the, there were 420 species and now there are 263. And what is going to survive in mm -hmm. years? Yes, absolutely. So, question about death and fiction. Um, yes, in history, everyone dies <laughs> necessarily. See, it's where we are today. Everyone who's not before us has died. And they often die in very tragic ways. So, my dissertation research is on motherhood, which is a very difficult and grim passage for women, um, certainly in the 18th and 19th centuries when I was researching. 
so many infants died, so many women died in childbirth. Um, and so I, I think partly I was drawn to history because of its tragic nature. I was always kind of tragic in. <laughs> Um, I've always had sort of a morbid streak, and so I was interested in digging into, I think, those fears that we all have about how we're going to go. Um, but then seeing the reality of the history has absolutely sort of shaped the way I think about realism and fiction. Um, it doesn't make sense to me that everyone makes it through okay, um, nor is it kind of emotionally uh, resonant to have everyone make it through okay. And that can be that can be death, but that can also be the kind of small everyday challenges that we're facing and overcoming. Um, the, the crises are also inevitable. Um, and the plants as characters and thinking about climate change as a sort of mass scale death, um, I think that absolutely plays into to how I wrote this book and how I consider tragedy, I think increasingly we're realizing that tragedy is not just a human experience, but it's a theological experience. Um, and how do you write about that while also providing room for hope and for joy and for appreciation of beauty? Um, so it was a challenge to sort of find that balance between paying this close attention to the magic of nature and also sounding the alarm bell about um, the kind of transience of it in our current era. What do you mean? This yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Katie and Kathy. This has been so, so insightful. Um, I'm a little more than halfway through the book, and, and now I'm determined to finish it. Um, for those in the room, we have uh, copies available in the garden shop. Uh, so please feel free to make your way over there. Uh, Kathy and Katie will be available to sign copies of the book and, and just chat. Um, also, feel free to check out Kathy's um, original paintings here, uh, drawings, I should say. Um, they're fantastic, and the detail is just incredible. Thank you all again for, for being here.